Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us tonight. So I'm Jessica Reynolds and I teach Experimental Unit 13 here at the AA with Lily Jenks and Judy El Hajar. And we're delighted to present this series of four virtual studio visits as part of the AA public programme. We have organised this in collaboration with Studio Visits, which is an online platform that facilitates studio visits with artists all around the world, both virtual and in person. And the Studio Visit format is really exciting as an opportunity to learn about art from the source, get behind the scenes, see what some works in process maybe, understand artworks from their point of creation, discover techniques um, that the different artists are using and interact live with the artist. And the format of the studio visit itself is open to interpretation by the artist. So some focusing on more traditional studio visits and other more experimental, but always insightful. So in our unit experimental 13, we're exploring the notion of unbuilding museums and challenging kind of monolithic singular institutions through multiple formal and social strategies. And this event has evolved out of a key strand of our research, interrogating processes of creation, display and engagement. So the theme of the whole series is loosely based on the concept of performing identity, and each artist will delve into their own angles and processes on this topic. Performing identity is not only about the plasticity of the self and the other, but also about challenging dominant narratives and stereotypes, mining underrepresented histories and harnessing and redeploying new technologies. So we're thrilled with the lineup of artists. Tonight we have Cambridge based artist Harold O'Fay. Um, and then in the next few weeks, we'll also meet with Turner Prize winning artist Tai Shani. Argentine painter Ad Minolitti and British multimedia artist Ed Fornielis. So I'm really excited to introduce Harold O'Fay this evening, whose artistic practice ranges from performance, video, photography, learning and social arts. He was born in 1977 in Ghana, lives and works in Cambridge, and he received his BA at the RCA, um, where he is a visiting tutor and also teaches at Goldsmiths and the Slade. So his work explores, or shall, shall, will be learning about this evening, explores the space created by the inhabiting of histories and he employs humour as a means to confront the viewer with historical narratives and contemporary culture. Um, we're really interested in how Harold uses the theme of identity in his own work and through his socially engaged projects. Um, he is known for snapping selfies um, using various persona um, and in his own words, he is a dancer, a smiler, a mammy, an Afrofuturist, Angela Davis in drag. So he's exhibited widely in the UK and internationally, um, including Tate Britain, Tate Modern, South London Gallery, Kettles Yard, Wising Art Centre and Studio Museum Harlem. And up, exciting upcoming projects include a new video commission for the Welcome Collection and bold, another commission for Bold Tendencies in Peckham. So the name of his talk tonight is Croydon Plays Itself, which is an exhibition title by the artist as well, which I'm sure we'll learn more about. So thanks, Harold, and over to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thanks for the intro. Um, really, really great uh, to be here with you at the AA. I wish I could be in in the AA, somewhere that I've been wanting to go to for a long time. But um, but anyway, uh, this is this is uh, yeah, just great to be here. Um, so yeah, as Jessica said, um, I will be talking about a specific project, um, which I did in uh, God, is it two thousand beginning of two thousand nineteen? Uh, dates this year has been so strange and weird that I don't even know where I am in the calendar but um uh, and it's a project I did with a, an amazing artist run uh project called turf projects which is in Croydon but I'll, I'll talk about that a bit I'm aware that um you know the this tonight's been sort of set up by uh, studio visits and is the premise is my studio <laughs> and um uh I think by the lineup of people that you've got kind of coming up I think that the, the sort of studio element is hopefully going to get a bit more Glamorous certainly will be next week with Ty Shani, who's just really amazing, amazing artist, and um, I think has a really amazing studio. But uh, but certainly out of my own inadequacies, I feel like I should address the studio. I mean, I think and my relationship 
to the studio and and, and what what that means. Um, I mean, the physical space where where I'm speaking to you from now is just basically um, uh, a room that I have here in Cambridge. I've actually only just moved just outside of Cambridge. I moved uh, just over six weeks ago into this, it's a very domestic space. And essentially I don't, my practice, I, I'm not a maker in the way that some other artists are, like in terms of thinking about kind of production and um, physically making things here. I mean, my practice is very sort of situational and site specific and performative. So it tends to, the work tends to be made in spaces and galleries or outside of galleries or in kind of collaboration. And outside of that, what I tend to be doing is administration. Um, so, you know, this is a, a desk. Wow, exciting. Um, and um, I mean, this, this laptop that I'm speaking to you from now is basically my studio. I mean, I mean, there are lots of discussions about what I think in art is called post-studio practice, the idea of, artists operating outside of um, the kind of sort of physical space of making in the space um, and partly because of a lot of what I do is you know editing videos or um, or actually just discussions you know um, it's a sort of real challenge to kind of describe studio practice um, but I think one of the interesting things for me actually has been you know over the last six seven months with everything being directed through formats like Zoom is actually that I've sort of now started to try and utilize this space as the studio space. And particularly as I'm interested in performance and performativity and thinking about kind of modes of sort of representation um, and transmission and systems of communicating, particularly within popular culture, that's something I've sort of been trying to kind of embrace a little bit in some of the things that I do. But um, again, I, I won't dwell on this for too long, but one of the things that I might do is just maybe share, because in the studio often what I'm doing in terms of my book collection, which sadly is still boxed up because I'm waiting for some shelves to be delivered. All domestic details that you're not interested in, but I thought what I would share is um, just some, uh, a little video that I made of just some books that I'm reading at the moment. So hopefully, can you all see this? Hopefully, so yeah, I'll just let this play. Hopefully there's no sound on this. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, often what I'm doing in, in the studio is just kind of referencing texts. Um, this is a book that I'm looking at at the moment on social choreography. Um, by Andrew Hewitt, um, which was suggested to me by a curator that I'm working with, Ed Vasey, for this project that I'm doing at Welcome Collection, which will hopefully open next year, but um, which I'm sort of interested in the kind of history of social dance, um, and particularly thinking of like these weird phenomena like dance marathons and dancing plagues, medieval dancing plagues, AIDS, dance-a-thon, marathons. Um, so yeah, I've been looking at that, and then um, I haven't started reading this yet, but um, this is uh, Decol Decolonising the Camera, which is a really great book by Mark Seeley, who um, founded Autograph, um, which is an organisation uh, for, for black photographers. Um, and it's a really great overview about thinking about how systemic racism was built into the development and history of photography. Um, so really thinking about um, particularly inbuilt biases within the photographic process and then thinking about um, also how black bodies are subject of the kind of the gaze and the camera. Um, this interesting book by Lynn Siegel, again, this is related to what I've been looking at in relation to um, social dance. So Lynn Siegel's book, Radical Happiness. It's again, really sort of thinking about um, joy and happiness in relation to different kind of cultural examples and manifestations of that and really thinking about the kind of politics of happiness and joy and how that's kind of sort of framed or has been framed um, and has some really great kind of like um, specific examples through antiquity through the contemporary um, yeah so that's been a kind of nice reference sorry what else is there i'll slightly speed through this yeah and then i just <laughs> these are some things i was in edinburgh about a month ago in september and was sort of book shopping 
Um, and these are just things that I came across in like secondhand bookshops. Like Edinburgh's got these amazing secondhand bookshops. So this is like um, a Bernard Shaw book. I mean, I don't even know, we didn't really know much about this story, The Adventures of a Black Girl in Her Search for God. And this copy is from the 1930s. And I just thought the illustrations were, I mean, really interesting. The premise of it is really interesting. I mean, I, there were some problematic things in terms of, you know, um, I think the conceptualizing of this black woman in search of God and sort of sort of primitivist um, framings of, of this black woman. But but anyway, it was something that um, I, I haven't sat down to properly read it yet, but um, it's kind of interesting. Also, we'll just try and jump ahead a little bit. Um, and then I just found um, in this bookshop, these a couple of books really sort of that were sort of mapping West African kind of colonial histories. So my family's from Ghana, which used to be the Gold Coast. And this is again a book from the 30s that's kind of um, a sort of colonial kind of guide to Ghana. Um, and for me, it was just really sort of fascinating because it has all these uh, like documentary kind of photographs and it's sort of mapping um, Ghanaian culture. Um, and this is all kind of pre-independence. Um, and it just got me thinking because um, my mum was born in 1957, which was when sort of Ghana was made independent. So she's like, so she's the same age as kind of Ghana. And it's interesting to kind of engage with, you know, this, this documentation of colonial era. Um, yeah, so that was one thing. And then what else? And then the other thing that I found, I'll just show the cover, is with this book of Nigeria, and it's it's um, a special independence Nigeria magazine, and of course um, that was 1960 that Nigeria became independent, and so here we are in 2020, and it's it's been the anniversary very recently, actually, of Nigerian independence. So I was like really excited to sort of find this magazine that was produced um, in the year of Nigeria's independence, and the kind of optimism in this sort of just post-colonial kind of period. Um, and this is before, you know, the tragedies of the kind of Biafran civil war and, and you know, all the military dictatorships in the 70s and 80s. And um, yeah, it's just a really sort of fascinating kind of sort of document. Um, but yeah, so they, I mean, they're, they're things that I'm sort of avid kind of like book kind of collector. So it's just give people a bit of an insight into stuff that I've been looking at. Um, okay, I'll stop sharing here. But yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm not deliberately tonight not going to kind of do like a kind of chronology of my practice. If anyone wants to kind of get an overview of various projects, um, you can go to my website, it's haroldoffay.com. Um, I thought I'd focus specifically on one project um, and maybe as a way of kind of giving insight to my methodologies and my approaches. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of my work is kind of constituted and framed by an engagement with performance. And for me, um, performance is really a sort of uh, methodological tool. Like I'm really interested in um, the idea of kind of actions and gestures, um, staging, um, uh, and particularly this idea of embodiment as well as 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 tools for investigation um, and um, and often in relation to kind of exploring histories and that's something I've been looking at recently and a lot of projects I think over my career have engaged with the idea of the archive or uh, whether that's institutional archives in the form of museums or collections or more idiosyncratic um, so there's a there's a kind of series of works that I've done um, over the years that is called covers where I've um, sort of performed and reenacted album covers um, of singers like Grace Jones. Um, and there's a the more recent manifestation of that series is uh, performing album covers of singers from the eighties, uh, male soul singers, um, so behind me, hopefully, you can see um, Mr. Teddy Pendergrass um, in this lounging pose. Um, let's get out one. 
Um, and I've been interested in this kind of trope of these black male singers from the 80s. Um, so people like Michael Jackson, Lionel Richie, Billy Ocean. And there's this period in, within the early 80s of these singers adopting these poses on album covers. So I've been really trying to think about um, what's at stake in this form of representation, particularly thinking about the album cover as a piece of sort of visual communication that, you know, uh, has an express function, which is obviously to kind of market and promote the identity of the artists, the performers. Um, but thinking about them as historical documents now, looking back, thinking more about uh, how one might read into narratives of representation of blackness, of masculinities. Um, and this particular reclining pose has such a kind of uh, art historical um, resonance in terms of, if we think about kind of like, you know, this classical repose, whether that's within um, uh, statues from antiquity or, um, you know, uh, Manet's paintings or uh, even Henry Moore sculptures, which are always in this kind of reclining figure. Um, so yeah, um, and for me, an essential part of doing that is by assuming the pose and really thinking through what does it mean to, often I think it's easy to kind of dismiss parodying or copying. Um, but actually I'm really interested in pedagogically, like what happens when you actually physically copy? And I think it's such a part of popular culture, like, you know, particularly like on YouTube or on Instagram, the kind of the remake, the recopy, you know, um, um, and the amount of work and observation and attention, I'm interested in what's at stake within that. Um, so, I mean, maybe what I'll do is, is I'll go into screen sharing again and pull up uh, the presentation. Oops. Um, hold on, let me get rid of this. And So, yeah, I mean, um, just a, a little bit of a kind of sort of preamble, really, with um, this this project. Um, so the uh, the project was called uh, Croydon, Croydon Plays Itself, and I was invited by Turf Projects, which is, um, like I said, it's an artist-run space in, in Croydon, was set up by a group of recent graduates, um, and it's currently housed in... Um, the Whitgift Shopping Centre um, in Croydon. I don't know if anyone from Croydon is listening. I mean, it'd be good to um, like <laughs> make yourselves visible, make yourselves known. There may even be people that live in Croydon, hopefully that have been attracted by the titling of this. I should just sort of claim I don't live in Croydon um, and I'm not claiming to speak um, for Croydon, but, um, uh, but anyway, I was really excited and privileged really to be have this opportunity to work with turf projects because I think they're a really interesting, exciting space and model of a, a um, of a kind of gallery, um, and they have a really interesting way of working, uh, which is very integrated into the community. Um, but their invitation to me was linked into responding to um, Croydon's museum, which is a sort of municipal council-run museum in. Um, in a really fantastic Victorian, high Victorian building in the centre of Croydon. And the invitation was sort of premised around responding to kind of objects and material within the museum. And I had the privilege of doing several visits that were facilitated, but uh, it was one of these very open offers where I was like, I don't really know where to start. Um, and I think one of the things about, I think, responding to um, archives, is sort of trying to find an internal logic about how one approaches or engages with the material. So mine was a bit idiosyncratic in that I just decided that I would just pick random things that I was interested in and then, then try and negotiate connections between um, uh, these objects. So I'll just take, this is just the beginning, just to show you some of the things that I was responding to. Um, and I'll, I'll try and be, be brief in, in, in talking through them, but um, 
So these are some books by um, a, a writer called Havelock Ellis, who was uh, a sort of uh, late Victorian Edwardian sexologist. Um, so he was writing about the kind of psychology of sex in very frank ways. Um, uh, he was somebody that was born in Croydon and lived in Croydon as well. Um, was one of the first writers to talk about homosexuality um, uh, from a sort of very scientific point of view, um, not moralistically in terms of condemning, but just thinking about sexual behaviours. So in some ways quite radical, um, but he was also for a time a eugenicist. So this rather sort of sinister kind of engagement with, um, you know, this history of kind of like, uh, categorizing and racially profiling people as well. Um, so his books were there and represented. Um, and then in the museum also, I'm gonna jump about a bit, so people have to bear with me, um, was this amazing t-shirt that was donated uh, by Ian Lads of uh, Croydon's first pride. So uh, Croydon's gay pride in 1993. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, it was really interesting just to see this T-shirt and there was a pamphlet, this kind of community, grassroots community thing that was kind of set up. Um, and I think there was a long gap between the kind of mid-90s till maybe, I think, four or five years ago that Croydon Pride has been resurrected and is now the sort of second biggest Pride in London. And, and it's quite a big kind of community event, certainly in South London. So for me, it was really interesting to think about the origins of that. Um, and then some other things. Um, so like there's this history of kind of like um, lavender fields in the south of the borough on the borders with Surrey. Um, and there are some community projects where um, there's a community lavender field and um, visitors are able to kind of go and kind of, you can pick lavender in um, the Croydon Surrey borders. But also previously, there's this history of people selling lavender water. Um, and oh yeah, so these are just some shots of the museum. Um, um, I came across this amazing um, Afro-British composer uh, called um, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who um, was this amazing kind of uh, Victorian classical composer, um, trained at the Royal College of Music. Um, and in his time was like a really um, lauded, successful uh, classical composer. He did several tours of um, the US. I think he even met Teddy Roosevelt at some point. But again, this is somebody who was from Croydon and, and lived in Croydon. And there's a legacy in the borough of a kind of community center that is um, uh, named after um, Coleridge Taylor. And I've sort of subsequently gone on to be a bit fascinated by um, his music. Um, um, so I just wanted to kind of contextualize. So I was choosing and looking at these objects and, and something I became really fascinated with was, was the way in which the museum, maybe I should just go back. Um, so you can see an internal shot of the museum, um, the way in which it was displaying these objects. So they have these boxes, um, um, sort of light boxes, um, so there's a very particular way of displaying the work and light boxes with text and objects are shown in particular ways. And just that history, that visual, museological design language of presenting objects was something that I was kind of really interested in. I, I just sort of was just um, thinking about at the time. So I'm just sharing research that um, I was doing before instigating the project, um, starting the project. Um, and thinking about how artists had sort of how other artists had engaged with kind of like um, museum and design retail design and again I was really aware that the turf projects is in a shopping center um, so what does it mean to have a gallery that's in a shopping center that's a kind of retail space um, so this is like a really famous project by um, the Scandinavian art duo um, Elm Green and Dragset maybe some of you are familiar with, um, sort of their Prada Marfa project where they created a kind of Prada store in the desert. Um, uh, yeah, just as a kind of a weird sort of like retail folly. <laughs> um, 
and yeah you have to be happening to be driving along the highway to kind of come across this um and then just thinking about kind of again how other artists so this is like jeff coombs kind of vitrine piece with like um you know these these kind of hoovers um and again what i like about it is this this like museum design language that's also then been kind of co-opted and put into the kind of gallery space so that this kind of conversation between like um retail marketing and then museum display um that's really kind of cannibalistic i think in the way that it kind of sort of both of those spaces just keep referencing each other back and forth um another artist uh sylvie fleury um yeah who again um takes like really everyday design objects um you know so like a shopping trolley but makes it in like this kind of like sexy kind of gold plate um and then she's using in a way sort of like luxury retail design language but also museum display with like pedestals and stuff um and again yeah these are her like sort of perfume bottles that again it's become becomes about an aesthetic um and then um something that i mean i'll show some documentation of the, the show that i made i'm gonna get there but um uh the, the summer before doing the show um i went to to venice and um was just happened to be on holiday and there happened to be this like fiorucci um exhibition <laughs> Um, so Fiorucci being the kind of like, um, you know, Italian fashion label, which has sort of had a resurgence, it's been sort of bought out and um, yeah, it's it's sort of been revived as a sort of brand, but it's very much associated with like the 70s and 80s. Um, and they had this like, it's only a show that I think could happen in Italy. Um, I, I sort of love Italian design aesthetic, but like in this like palazzo, they just like full on went out for this like amazing install of of um of garments and merchandise um and i was really again really intrigued by the kind of like language and display and presentation um and again that sort of like looking like a kind of boutique but actually being in a museum space and, and trying to sort of navigate the two um so so really this, I, I'm talking about this because this is really influenced, basically I just ripped off or tried to rip off this whole aesthetic for the show that I did. But um, but yeah, so just some images. Uh, oh yeah, just more museum display. And again, um, I will come back to this, but shopping channels are something I've been really interested in as well. In um, So this turntable that you see here is something that I'm interested in, in the way that um, museum documentation happens so they use these turntables to um digitally photograph and video objects that are then maybe put up onto websites and i was interested in like sort of like this kind of weird parallel with um shopping channels and again the language of presentation and display uh within sort of shopping channels anyway so um this is croydon place itself so this is turf projects which is it's basically a retail unit in the Whitgift shopping centre. So, um, so this is just some documentation of the installation um, with some Croydon residents. Um, and I, I was really explicitly very much interested in really thinking about this play to this audience um, um, and really thinking about the retail space. So hence kind of sort of borrowing a lot from um, you know, the design aesthetics and retail aesthetics. Um, so within the space, I'm presenting um, either objects that reference things that I encountered in the museum. Um, so, and I was really interested as an outsider, someone not being from Croydon, really trying to think through um, me as a stranger navigating Croydon. And Croydon is somewhere for those people that aren't familiar with it as a kind of sort of suburb of South London that, you know, is often a space that's decried as being ugly or boring in the way that I think sort of um, suburban uh, um, places in relation to major cities often are thought of 
as. Um, so I was really aware of kind of sort of coming into Croydon and then trying to really think about navigating the space and trying to think about thinking through these amazing histories of objects that I just found. Um, so um, uh, a, a lot of the work that is also shown, I decided um, and was uh, thankfully facilitated by TERF projects. I really wanted to kind of sort of um, speak to and work with um, people that lived and worked in Croydon. Um, and I'll talk to specific works in a bit, but, um, um, but this involved working with um, Croydon School of Art, which is um, a department of sort of Croydon College, um, which, um, uh, which is the basically kind of, it's the remnant of this kind of like long historical art school, Croydon School of Art has a long history going back to the 19th century. Um, and they have students from pretty much all over South London um, doing various arts courses and access courses and foundation courses. Um, so I did a few workshops um, with um, the students um, and that was a way really of having this conversation about um, some of the things that I'd found, uh, historical artefacts that spoke to Croydon, but also in a way engaging with their experience of contemporary Croydon. Um, so, um, so the show is kind of constituted um, by, you probably saw that turntable, um, uh, that's in the middle of the show that's in the shop window and on it is mounted a video. Um, so that video is called Croydon Keeps Turning. And again, I was really interested in this, having this kind of platform, again, of thinking about the language of display and presentation. Um, so uh, really directly thinking about presenting to this audience that's constantly just walking by and maybe the idea that people will only ever see the show in passing. Um, but also really thinking about, again, the turntable being a system for presenting objects and looking at objects. And, um, but also it could be a platform for performance. Um, so um, this video is really interspersed between um, a workshop that I did where I was inviting the students from Croydon School of Art to perform and pose on on the platform and then also presenting these objects for museums so this is the kind of lavender um, and then in the museum in the not in the museum in the gallery um, I had a, a lavender diffuser of lavender oil that we got from this community lavender project in the south of the borough um, so you can actually smell Croydon and I was thinking about sensorially what does Croydon smell like what does Croydon taste like um, what does it look like? There's this, some, some slightly geeky historical things like Croydon, the, the name itself comes from the fact that in, med, in the medieval period, um, it was the center of uh, growing crocuses. Um, and crocuses, uh, the plant, the flowers, you get saffron. So its wealth came from saffron. And there's even a square now that's called the Saffron Square. And a few years ago, there was a community project where they um, grew uh, crocuses in the center of Croydon um, as a way of speaking to this history. History And sort of saffron even now is still quite an expensive um, uh, spice um, that's sort of traded. Um, so yeah, we ha also have some of these, um, these bulbs. Um, and then, yeah, there are these performance interventions of me lounging. Again, I was interested in this idea of kind of like, um, sort of like performing within the space. Um, and yeah, it's really nice that people are kind of just coming up and looking and kind of questioning. And it, for me, this was just a way of trying to kind of rupture this like thing of people passing through this kind of retail space kind of constantly. And, uh, you know, I was really interested in transposing these album covers, which for me speak to this idea of like black performativity and what does it mean to like embody blackness and then try and place that in like these slightly unusual uh, spaces. So yeah, this is the book of Havelock Ellis. So it's just like, again, these museum objects that um, uh, I was just sort of like um, 
um, photographing and, and documenting that are, are again sort of mixed with um, objects um, that were in the museum. Um, maybe I'll keep going, um, go through some of these slides. Um, so maybe I'll talk through this project, um, which is, um, so um, in the Havelock Ellis book, so this is of the uh, late Victorian Edwardian sexologist, I was like sort of really thinking through him as this quite radical figure that lived in Croydon. Um, and one of the books I came across was his, uh, an early study of his that looked at um, the history of kind of criminology um, and linked to his interest in um, eugenicism um, and eugenics. Um, was this really haunting image. Um, I mean, it's, you can sort of see it if I just, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but there's a sort of photocopy of it here. There's this kind of um, image of a prisoner um, uh, in a New York prison um, who's being documented. And I think just to kind of slightly preface this in the sort of late 19th century, mid 19th century, photography and eugenics were kind of closely linked. There was a belief in, um, you know, photographing and mapping in order to find kind of criminal types or racial types that could be categorized. Um, so a kind of pseudoscience that came out of um, a, a kind of investigation and use of photography. And so in this kind of prison from in upstate New York, the, the prison have created this like weird mirror that um, allows the prisoner to be photographed from various angles. So within the one photograph, you can see in profile, you can see above. So it's a way of surveying and profiling prisoners. Um, so one of the things that I did was to kind of recreate this mirror, which I call the Havelock mirror, just because um, Havelock Ellis is referencing it. Um, and it becomes an object that's in the space that people that visitors can kind of engage with. Um, and I was sort of really interested in how this quite sinister object in a way had really also retail parallels. Cause I was thinking about like changing rooms in like, uh, you know, like Topshop or Topman where, you know, you can go in and there are these mirrors that allow you to see the items that you, but it's another way of surveying your body. And it's another way of seeing these multiple angles. Um, so uh, I, I did this kind of, again, as part of the whole kind of posing workshop where I was inviting the students from Croydon School of Art. Um, we had this photographic session where we were posing in this contraption and really thinking about um, uh, how, uh, how we were kind of engaging with this historical sort of um, uh, artifact that we'd remade. Um, so yeah, these are kind of photographs in a way I sort of kind of documenting documenting that um so yeah this is saffron that we were giving people to to take anyway this is a way of telling that that link to kind of croydon i'll come back to this but um sorry let me go through some things um and then some other elements this is um again that t-shirt that was in um the museum from Croydon's first Pride in 1993. Um, we, with uh, sort of permission from the museum, we reissued it. Um, so we remade, um, took the design and remade the t-shirt and we were selling it as a way of raising money for that year's Croydon Pride. So it was a kind of way of really sort of speaking to the kind of history, the historical Pride, this first Pride in 1993 and the community activism that led to the development of that. And then this uh, revived Croydon Pride. Um, so yeah, as a way of kind of linking those two moments in history. Um, and then other things we did um, at the, um, the youth centre that was named after um, uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, um, a sort of um, Afro-British, Black British com classical composer. Uh, so this youth centre is named after him. We did, um, a sound workshop actually. So um, again, it was thinking about what Croydon sounds like. So um, so we did a series of kind of like um, 
uh, sessions with the young people there um, and sort of created this kind of vocal soundtrack and that was also incorporated kind of like sound walks from different parts of kind of Croydon. So that soundtrack was kind of sort of punctuating the space. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, these prints are kind of um, risograph prints that again were made with a different class at Croydon School of Art. Um, and again, I was really interested in a lot of the museum conversation was looking back. Um, so with this, um, I don't know if people know what a risograph machine is, it's kind of sort of Japanese like photocopier that allows you to print like multiple layers of colour. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's it's quite exciting process as well. You can use collage and text and drawing and incorporate that. But um, so I asked um, in this workshop, we had a conversation about thinking about the future of Croydon and really thinking about people's experiences of Croydon now. So um, yeah, this came out of a workshop session. So those were kind of displayed. Um, and then um, uh, this is a video that was presented in the space. Um, so the title Croydon Plays Itself um, was something I wanted to kind of speak to really was the fact that sort of Croydon has this um, role within film history. It's often used, or it has been used in lots of Hollywood films, um, but it's used as a location because it can be turned into other places. So this film that you can see now is was shot in Croydon, this scene, but it's for a film uh, where Croydon has been made to look like Istanbul. Um, and there, there are various instances of this. So um, it's in, uh, Croydon is, is used in one of the Batman films, so it becomes Gotham City. There's another film where it becomes New York. Um, and, um, uh, um, I was sort of really interested in a slight anecdote, but um, uh, the year before doing this project, I'd been in Toronto, which is another city that is used constantly for film locations. Um, and uh, I was speaking to someone who was saying, well, basically Toronto is used because it's very generic and it's boring and it sort of doesn't really have a very clear, it just looks like an average North American city. Um, but, um, uh, filmmakers like to 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 quote to to, to put Toronto in drag, um, so it's like I was really interested in this idea of a place being in drag. So uh, whenever it's used, it's always being made up to look like somewhere else. And and Croydon is very similar to this, you know. And um, the borough council has a really good film unit, and they really promote themselves and the fact that you know come to Croydon, where you can you can you can make Croydon look like anywhere you want it to be, you know. Um, so um, for me, I just kind of thought um, um, it'd be really interesting to have like this one example of where um, Croydon plays itself by revealing these histories and narratives about Croydon. So that hence, um, uh, yeah, hence, hence the title. Um, and also there's a, there's a really amazing film um, called LA Plays Itself, which some people might know which is made up of kind of like um, classic Hollywood films set in Los Angeles that tell narratives about Los Angeles. Um, anyway, so, um, yeah, so this is it kind of installed. Yeah, this is Brazil, the Terry Gilliam film. So, um, yeah, they, there's a power station in Croydon that was used in that, in that film. So it plays a dystopian future um, in, that, in that film. Um, yeah, so, oh yeah, sorry, I haven't showed, let me show, yeah, this, this was the detail of the Havelock mirror, so yeah, that original Victorian kind of contraption, and then um, the kind of sort of remake that we did um, as a way of kind of speaking to that history. Um, okay, I'm aware that I've been talking for a long time, so I'll just, I'll just go through these last slides really, and then I'm, um, happy to stop talking and take any questions. Um, I'm aware that it's also like, it's sort of a very multi-form project. So um, if any of it hasn't made sense, I'm, I'm happy just to try and, there's lots of compartments and elements to it. So 
oh yeah, this is the last slide. So this is um, one of the really nice things that um, Turf Projects as a gallery do is for each exhibition they commission, they get an artist to design a patch, um, uh, so, which is really nice, actually, I think it was a really nice task, really, because you sort of have to think about distilling this exhibition and this project into like an object. Um, and then they, they then sell um, the patch um, in, the, in the store. Um, so yeah, it just allowed me to kind of think through elements of um, uh, things that I was putting together. So yeah, the pink triangle is obviously a kind of, kind of uh, queer symbol that's been obviously has a sinister past in relation to the Nazis, but was reappropriated by activists, particularly in, in the 80s and 90s. So yeah, that's, that's my patch. I think, I think that's it. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Great. Well, thanks so much, Harold, for an amazing um, insight into that project of yours, um, as well as all the ideas that you're working with. Um, and I think, just going back to the beginning, I think it's really interesting, the idea that your studio space almost sounds like it is your bookshelves or your books. Um, it's kind of like almost that's the space you occupy to make your work. Um, it's quite a nice take on what the studio is. Um, and... Um, yeah, yeah. So, so does that? I, I wonder if sort of that that the books kind of travel with you, your studio to studio. You probably had lots of different studios, and that's kind of um, a growing, like consistent element. Um, but maybe that's a kind of small question. And then um, I, I'm also interested in um, in well, I mean, the brief itself of this of the Croydon Plays itself project is so ama it's so amazing to be working with the museum and these objects and then interpreting them and. Um, uh, you know, I think it's so interesting where you're working with these um, really kind of political and um, kind of quite in, um, very intense themes, like whether it's criminology or, um, or, or all the different issues you're dealing with. Um, and so you sort of add this layer of humour and reinterpretation um, and um, you know, by by kind of um, using kind of completely different aesthetics, um, you kind of bring them to life, and kind of these issues sort of like are then kind of more accessible, or like engaged with in a different way. So it'd be interesting to hear you talk about that a bit more. Maybe the kind of humor aspect, or the way you kind of translate these kind of um, these kind of archival um, deep histories into. Um, future histories so great thank you <laughs> um maybe i'll deal with the small question first <laughs> yeah. Time. um yeah the, the the kind of studio and books thing yeah i mean i think um you know uh yeah in a way the sort of studio becomes a kind of reference space in some ways like i think that idea of kind of um maybe because you know like I said there's a kind of like disconnect between what happens in this space which is sort of like um sort of thinking reflecting editing um dialogic um sometimes playful like I'm like often just like playing with gestures and and trying things out trying poses out or something um but then yeah like that um, so, so reading and, and referencing um, and collecting of material and sifting and editing through source material is is very much this space. And then, you know, um, the production sort of happens outside or is is like is situated, is situational, which I enjoy actually. I think that's kind of like um, uh, yeah, yeah, for me, it's kind of a really it makes me enjoy those moments where like, you know, I am in the gallery, like building something or making something or, or um, you know, uh, there's sort of, you know, I work might be working with like fabricators or, um, and the elements kind of come together or staging a live performance, you know, that's quite a lot of, I haven't shown a lot of that, but quite a lot of what I do is like performing in situ. So, um, I think that those two spaces for me operate in really kind of like interesting 
interesting ways. Um, I mean, I was slightly kind of like um, reticent about talking about it because I think people's expectations of the artist studio is is like there's a kind of romanticism about it, you know, when we think about certainly about sort of makers and sculptors and and you know I think people are, so I'm always like <laughs> you know. Like, apologetic because there's like there's not really any of that happening here um, um and in some ways i mean i think that's interesting i think it's important to acknowledge like certainly within contemporary practice that that that's quite a big there's lots of artists that do work like that that it is just like i mean maybe more like a design studio or something or like a you know in that it's um it's sort of planning and research that sort of happens and you know it's made elsewhere um I guess the other question about humour in relation to the material, I'm sort of, it's a really great question. I'm sort of um, trying to kind of ab ab absorb it really. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I was aware, um, I'm, I was slightly aware of my role within certainly these projects. I have done a few projects with archives and museums and particularly when you've got like a um, uh, a context, a social context, like Croydon, like a place, and you're not from that place, and you're trying to talk to people who are from that place, that there's a kind of tension there in that immediately I'm this outsider, and people are like, well, so how are you gonna, you're not from here, how are you gonna represent, you know, um, uh, how are you gonna represent this place, you know? Um, and I, so, what I was sort of explicitly sort of trying to do is try and be as transparent as possible actually and trying to use the fact that I'm not from there and that I don't know in a way I'm sort of like a kind of sort of idiot outsider I call it the kind of Louis Theroux strategy where you're sort of like that sort of naive kind of visitor to kind of like what's what's this and a bit, but I mean hopefully more genuinely than, than that but, but I just mean that strategy for me is about allowing people to kind of recognize their own knowledge and their own um, sense of agency in terms of, you know, like, yeah, you have all this, like, I don't know, tell me, like, you've had the, you've got these experiences at this place, you know? Um, and so I'm really invested in sort of trying to kind of draw that out. And um, it's also important because I think often as an artist, when you come to these things, people immediately feel like, well, you're the artist, you should know. and it's like, actually, I don't know, um, you know, and I mean, Croydon has a really special place for me in that it's where, I mean, I, haven't, I didn't really find a place for this in the work, but it's where I became a British citizen because, you know, Croydon has a sort of passport office and um, as a sort of naturalised, I was born in Ghana and sort of grew up, went to school in the UK. But when I was 18, I, I sort of I became naturalised and I could get citizenship. So I had to go down to Croydon to do that. And um, this was before all the kind of crazy, like British citizenship tests and stuff. All I had to do was like um, pledge an allegiance to the queen. <laughs> um, but all of that happened in Croydon. So for me, like my sense of like Britishness is Croydon because it happened in like a sort of sixties tower block with like, you know, a slightly bored middle-aged man standing in front of a portrait of her majesty, you know, so, um, so, so for me, Croydon is like, and it was a really, really exciting thing to do as an 18 year old. It was like, but, um, so yeah, I have this kind of affinity with Croydon that I was really excited when I got the invitation to kind of do it. And the humour, sorry, I haven't addressed the humour thing. I guess for me, it's just a really, uh, again, really thinking about how do you kind of engage audiences with some of this material? and really trying to think about the absurdities and contradictions that are in, in, inherent within it. Um, and sort of, um, I mean, particularly going with a kind of retail offer. I mean, I wish I had the real budget to go full Fiorucci on that space. Um, in a way, it was a kind of slightly <laughs> modest attempt at that. But, um, but again, I was really wanting to kind of draw attention to the ridiculousness, you know, so hence like lounging on a revolving turntable in a Croydon shop window, you know, 
I just, I was like, what am I going to do to get people to stop? Because <laughs> like, you know, because you know they're going to like Wilkinson's or Tesco's or like Peacock's or wherever. To, you know, um, you know, there's a H&M, all the kids are always going there. Like, I want them to stop. So um, I think, yeah, there was an, an explicit sort of attention seeking that I think it being a retail unit and not just a normal gallery, like allowed me to kind of, play to that, those sensibilities. Um. Yeah, I think you definitely got people to stop, so. <laughs> <laughs> Not for long though, they didn't eventually they just be fine. Um, so I think um, if anyone wants to ask a question, I think you can raise your hand. Um, I think, um, Lily, did you have a question? Or, or manager, yeah. Um, no, there's a question that's come through in the chat. Um, that uh, says that uh, there's an audience member who's really interested in your research into displays and would like to hear more on how you see the interplay between art and retail and um, which I guess is like a nice uh, segue from what you were just talking about about not having it in a, not having your show in a gallery but in a shop front um, and they've also asked if you took into account what artists like Oldenburg did and if so do these art history narratives have any influence on your work Oh my God, I'm getting the proper AA questions now. This is scary. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I think, you know, for me, like I said, I think when I was, sorry, maybe boring everyone at the beginning before just showing the work with the, the artist that I was looking at, I think, yeah, it's just, it's been interesting. I think this kind of like visual language and conversation between like, museum display and exhibition display and commercial gallery display and the imperatives behind that like what's at stake in presenting an artist's work curatorially um aesthetically thinking about um the values of communication that come through um and um, you know, the, yeah, the specific kind of language of that, trying to kind of speak to an object and explain what an object is. Um, and how I think that that becomes sort of has become sort of fetishized a bit. And then was, uh, you know, elements of that are sort of appropriated within kind of retail display. Obviously, the imperative is to sell this object, to market this object. Um, and then I'm not quite sure what happens in the, the sort of narrative between the two, but there's a kind of sort of back and forth, which is why I really love the kind of um, the Prada, Martha, Elm Green and Drag set work, which is really, we're just, you know, because, you know, that design aesthetic is sort of pure, like white cube, conceptual, kind of clean. And I mean, I guess we can might go back into the kind of like, um, sort of like modernist, histories around the kind of white cube as a kind of space for um you know the sort of blankness of of that space in order to kind of clear distraction and but that speaks so much to like the idea of fetish and just focusing on an object and and that object becomes an object of desire or of veneration um i mean i won't bore you with all my sort of views but for me that's so there's something very Protestant about that. Like, I think it's really, you know, the idea of sort of whitewashing and stripping the object back and, you know, but anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I just was really interested in then trying to kind of play between the two in a slightly more kind of like sort of trashy way, I think. Um, and for me, those Jeff Koons objects are really like funny, you know, um, and, and, and sort of very piss taking and, and, uh Sylvie Fluffy as well like you know um I mean they sort of represent I mean they're very much of the 80s as well um which Viorucci is as well which is that kind of like just excess you know um but for me that exaggeration I think really shows the kind of construct of some of that what's underpinning um which is about fetish and desire and um you know, these shiny things that we're trying to sort of draw, trying to draw people in. Um, uh, yeah, and sort of, again, for me, just applying that to this idea of kind of like, um, um, you know, museological or historical objects in a way, like 
could we sort of like fetishize? I mean, you know, ma- remaking that Havelock Ellis um, mirror as well. <laughs> um, I guess I was explicitly thinking about like, you know, um, what was going to be the kind of sort of retail offer for people coming into the gallery for the few that did come into the gallery um, and didn't just look in the window. So like, yeah, giving away free saffron and like making it smell like lavender and then they could take a selfie in the Havelock Alice mirror, you know. Um, uh, I guess it's deliberately trying to inculcate people into like these kind of histories. And um, so like you take a selfie in that mirror and you're like, that's, you're in dialogue with that object, which you know, has a sinister history and you can choose to look at the, the wall text and engage with that or or not. You can just kind of use it to make a kind of image. and But somehow that thing goes out there virally, maybe disconnected from its source, but you've, you've you know, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. yeah. Another question from Lily. I'm just going to unmute. Yeah, Hi. you can come on. Oh no, wait. Oh, one. sound is off. One second. I'm mute. <laughs> uh, Hi. <laughs> that was so enjoyable, Harold. Thank you so, so much. I mean, it's such a pleasure to you. see your work and see behind the scenes and say, and then see the scenes themselves and um, see the way that you're thinking about this work. And it made me think, you know, it seems like a lot of the work that you're doing is kind of like unpacking archives and and realigning some of the networks in them. And it, it made me wonder if you were working on your own archive. I mean, it made me, I was thinking about that beginning because I was like, oh, that bookshelf, you know, you're gonna have to unpack it and then you're gonna have to work out your filing system. And then I'm doing that a lot myself at the moment. So um, I was just interested in how you think about ordering that information yourself, if you're working potentially on your own archive. And and then I was thinking a little bit because Jess, I teach with Jess at the AA and, you know, we teach architects the, the things that they need to learn this year, right? And so we are building a kind of archive ourselves in a kind of hierarchy of knowledge. And as Jess said at the beginning, we're looking at unbuilding the Museum of Natural History and thinking about ways to unpack that natural history, that natural history, the Natural History Museum as an archive and how we could unbuild it, distribute it, repackage it, build it bigger, make it smaller, let's see. And I was wondering if you think there's still a space, you know, in these major museums that we have, these iconic, massive, canonic museums, like, if you feel there's much space for them, I feel like at the moment they're so problematic and that's good and they're being really worked on and kind of exercised and how if you have any thoughts about kind of the future of those bigger museums like you know that it's like the inverse of the turf space you know Mm. we keep having to unpack them maybe it's just like a constant process like a constant job we keep having to to work on them I just wondered if you thought that they had a, a place that was important still or, or I don't know if you think about them a bit sorry yeah. that's quite a big question but no that's no, really thank, no, thank you. Um, yeah. no thank you um yeah I mean I guess the first part was my own archive which is kind of like a sort of <laughs> to mess and um uh, but it's something I have been starting to kind of negotiate really in terms of having just moved I mean it forces you to kind of do that you're right um but so yeah, I recently redesigned my website as well, and that that was forcing me to sort out um, sifting through really, and really beginning to think about these structures of categorization and thinking about um, a way of kind of sort of mapping processes and methods and thinking as well, and, and trying to trying to make that a bit more kind of kind of creative. I mean, I haven't sort of resolved that a bit as well, and. Um, um, I have sort of got vague plans um, to build like a sort of a dream studio in the garden, which will kind of like, I I think hopefully like facilitate um, me thinking about a relationship to some of these things and um, and maybe try and be a bit more playful. And I think that's something I'm interested in, in your other question, which is about the kind of institutional sort of spaces and museums and sort of structures. 
that yeah obviously are still really sort of problematic and particularly in relation to kind of colonial narratives and sort of manifestly problematic forms of collection which are about still about domination and uh ownership and um operating often very um kind of linear forms as well like um I think often as an artist kind of entering these spaces I feel like I feel like I'm sometimes a fly in the ointment really because um like I know one of the things that often really drives like archivists sort of mad is like you know because they're often these systems um and uh you know so you're meant to kind of like bring all your references and then submit those and I just love browsing and it's amazing I mean it's a bit like maybe it's a sort of like psychogeography Guy Debord the term kind of thing of just like browsing through the archive it's amazing how you just fuck up the kind of like you know, excuse my language um just sort of mess up the like the kind of structure of just literally and that's one of the things I really love doing is just browsing and now just you know I guess being a sort of flanner in these archives or trying to be as much as you can but um something I think is really important and this is maybe it, it feels like I'm trying to slide out of your really pertinent kind of question because I think I've been thinking about you know the challenge to obviously these kind of museums and institutions to really um you know, question these structures and forms that are the basis of, um, you know, their, their power and their finances and their economies is that, um, is that the fact that it's happening all the time actually within these institutions. Like I'm an, I'm an artist, that I, I work quite a lot, particularly within like gallery education and learning. And it's the one dominant consistent space um, within these institutions where a lot of these things are happening um, and but is often given the least visibility which I also think is interesting and, and again speaks to for me a wider institutional problem of like so these institutionalized institutions recognize that they need to be engaging audiences and they need to be engaging certain types of artists and really really thinking through but there's no they don't give proper discourse or platforms to these things, these parasitic or insurgent things that are happening. Um, and the most interesting radical conversations that I've had have been in these spaces, these kind of learning, public programming spaces, these adjunct spaces. So, um, and it's, for me, that's becomes, you know, it's revealing, I think, really about, um, you know, I think the kind of crisis at these institutions. Um, but in some ways, for me, it's also interesting in that, um, that you know, it, it, there is a space where it's kind of sort of going on. And sometimes I think I don't necessarily have this. <laughs> I think it's it, it, certainly the kind of like learning curators and, and um, uh, people that are working in public programming are deliberately because, you know, there's this kind of hierarchy within these institutions. So the focus is always on the, the big sexy touring exhibitions or like that, that are driving the sales and the bookshops and whatever. Um, the, I think they use that as kind of cover because, you know, I mean, they're often really amazing, like uh, like artists and, off, you know, I mean, sadly it's mostly where you find artists of color and women and queer artists in, you know, I call it the sort of back door, but, um, but, but for me, that's, that's, that's a slight personal project that I have, which is really, I think, to try and speak to um, these insurgent practices that are happening, you know, because I have done projects where, you know, you know, with, uh, with schools or communities where like thinking through like museum structures or like collections, like, and um, like I've done sort of like, you know, guerrilla performances in the Tate and taken over like galleries and things like that, you know. Um, I'm sure exhibition curators would be horrified by some of the stuff. Um, but yeah, so it's these insurgent practices, I think, but the next step is to, but these things need a discourse. They need, to, in order to, you know, just the way that kind of knowledge is disseminated, um, 
yeah, sorry, it's a really long rambling answer to kind of your question. And I haven't really answered your question. Because I think there's a there's a whole nother thing about kind of structural change and thinking about new models of setting up museums. So like like even the activity of collecting as a colonialist project, you know, the idea that I'm just gonna acquire these things, like, you know, that even I think we even have to kind of question that. Um I'd, yeah, I'd be really interested to know what you've been doing in 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 the unit that you're doing. But yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there's a hand up, isn't there as well? Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um thank you for the presentation. It's really inspiring. Oh, thank you. I, I kind of like want to ask, um, so because you were talking about, say, um, scent and because I'm really interested in scent and gender and if they are related in any way, like, so do you, like, when you're approaching space in some way, do you ever feel like the space is, like, gendered? And say the, the scent project you did about, say, the, the scent of Croydon when you're doing it, does, like, any of that kind of come in, like, can you talk a bit more about how you can like reach the scent in some way? Oh God, that's another tough AA question. Um, mm, scent and gender. Um, yeah, I mean, oh. I mean, I think in a way, I, in in the Croydon Place itself project, I really just sort of touched on um, the idea of the the kind of scent. Um, as a sort of personification or a way of articulating or speaking to a sensorial experience <clears throat> of a place. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I mean, I don't necessarily thought, I didn't necessarily kind of go into it and think about it as being gendered. I mean, obviously there's an association, I think, with sort of kind of perfume, um, you know, certainly being kind of marketed um, towards towards women and and being kind of commercialized in that kind of way. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I wasn't strictly thinking about it in, the, in as a kind of uh, as a narrative around a sort of uh, a gendered reading, really, of, of 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 Croydon through that. But I think you can. I mean, it's a good way of of, of definitely sort of thinking through that. But I guess my um, impetus was really thinking more about this kind of sensorial and, and trying to kind of cut through in a sort of more playful way, um, mm -hmm. an experience of place that is, is maybe framed as much by, you know, smell and taste and, um, and sound and I don't know, I mean, there's kind of, um, uh, sort of, I'm sliding out of this question now, I'm dodging it, but uh, sort of a few, no, in, in the early 2000s, I did a residency in Brazil, um, in, um, in Rio de Janeiro, and it was really interesting to kind of just like engage with like the history of um, sort of artistic practices like in Brazil and, and certain artists and, mid-century artists and movements like Tropicalia, um, which I, I probably shouldn't launch into talking about now, but um, I allow people to kind of explore on their own. But, um, but anyway, certainly this modernist Brazilian project by uh, artists where they, in Brazil, where they were trying to kind of find a language really that spoke to the experience of the cliched idea of living in the tropics but also engage with modernist narratives. And part of that was the sensorial. So they were kind of playing with the idea of the kind of like touch being a really important part of like Brazilian modernism, you know, would like, um, so these artists would create experiences or happenings or um, the idea of, um, there's a brilliant artist called Leslie Clark um, uh, who creates these like suits and these masks where, um, you wear, you'd wear them in the gallery and she'd put spices or senses. Um, so it's this idea you explore the space or another artist, Elio Ochasika. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think there are still works in the Tate, Tate Modern, hopefully. I mean, um, 
you know, where you explore a space barefoot, um, you know, uh, so I think th that's something I'm, I've been trying to kind of think through for a while and, and maybe there's a slightly, I mean, there's a thing about kind of like European modernism that's very, um, again, maybe I'm generalizing here, but it sort of privileges the visual so much, you know, in a sort of, and maybe that's something to do with like a kind of, uh, about a rationality or, or ordering that sense of the kind of, um, the visual aesthetics of everything. Whereas what I really liked about this kind of um, sort of Brazilian modernism was thinking through the more sensory and sensuous and yeah. Um, and actually there's quite a lot of, of, of women artists as well that are sort of really driving forces in that in those in those movements but but yeah sorry no, thank you. um i actually have a question um that uh, i really loved your talk i thought it was amazing how you were able to kind of uh i guess incorporate identity through the individual the kind of group um or the community as well as of an entire place um, and I loved how you also talked about um, cities or places being in drag and uh, actually the Canadian pavilion at the next Venice Architecture Biennale, whenever it happens, um, is about imposter cities and it's really looking at Toronto as being this place that's in loads of films. Oh, wow. um, so maybe maybe you have to do a whole pavilion about Croydon. <laughs> um, but I was just curious as to like in kind of personifying the city or trying to capture the identity of a place, like, how do you, it's so complex because in a way it incorporates all the people, the objects, the groups. And when you were talking about, um, I guess, what does it mean to embody blackness? I was curious as to like, how did you find a way to embody place? And um, the second part of my question would probably be, um, I don't know, there's something really interesting in moving, um, in kind of having your show in a shop front and the kind of who, the barriers of accessing a museum, like who doesn't feel like they can go to a museum and experience art or culture and how by moving that context to like a less pressure, moving it to a less precious context of a shop front, does it suddenly make art and the experience more accessible um, to people that don't feel like they can experience museums? Um, yeah, so embodying place was the kind of, yeah, that's a really, um, yeah, I mean, I, that's really, I mean, I think, <clears throat> I guess the, the, for me, the embodying blackness thing has been thinking through um, these images as reference within popular culture and really by trying to embody those, think through the situations and, and strategies or tactics that, that um, that had led artists to be kind of like, um, uh, it led artists to negotiate the presentation of their identity. Um, you know, there's, um, there's this really interesting quote that I've been sort of thinking through, which is around this idea of posing in particular. So like, um, I've forgotten the writer's name, it'll come back to me, but it's, um, anyway, but the, the quote is to strike a pose is to pose a threat. Um, and it's by an American uh, art critic. Um, anyway, it will come back to me. But, but I, I, there's something I'm really interested in, the idea of the pose and figuration, and um, but also that idea of just existing, you know, and, and the idea of sort of the presence, your presence being a provocation or a sort of challenge. And I mean, that quote was very much posed in relation to queer bodies and the visibility of queer bodies. Um, but I think it can be applied to kind of other other bodies as well that um, are either sort of marginalised or attacked or rendered invisible. Um, and I guess there's a kind of, for me, maybe within that project, there was a similar approach to thinking about kind of Croydon and um, <clears throat> in, in certainly trying to kind of embody these histories um, and um, trying to kind of occupy space and be visible within the space. Um, um, hopefully, with, I'm not necessarily kind of claiming, you know, but um, for me, I think these interventions were about trying to um, engender a kind of like um, 
reflectiveness about Croydon as a, as a, as a place allowing people to think through or reflect on it, like the fact that, you know, it isn't maybe just this kind of 60s, what people call ugly, kind of brutalist environment, but, you know, it has a history of kind of like, you know, eugenics and sexologists and, and classical composers, and it has this rich interior kind of cultural life that is has somehow squeezed out of the narrative um, for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, um, and then I've forgotten the other part of the question, which was... Ooh, oh, it's just about by changing the context of where you show work, does it oh, mean yeah. that other people have access to it who maybe don't feel as welcome to kind of go to a museum or a gallery? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, that's, you know, one of the, I think, um, key things that I've been interested in as an artist working with performance is, is the kind of um, mutability or the chameleon-like nature of that and, and, and the fact that I've, I'm really excited about working in multiple contexts and the idea that, you know, I mean, I enjoy working in kind of galleries, but actually I find exhibition making quite exposing. <laughs> um, um, I mean, someone like Tai Shani, you'll have next, next week is, she's just an amazing exhibition maker like I mean her installations and her awareness and you know objects and performance and and video and sound and 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 that I mean she inhabits that space really really well um but but for me I think my main driver is audience I think I, I mean I, I say the one material that performance has because it doesn't have it's not like other mediums it doesn't you're not working with a specific materiality, but if it does, it's audience. I mean, performance is always concerned with audience. So I always then think about the encounter with the audience and where is that situated? And how am I, what is the, who's, how is the audience constituted? How am I framing the audience? And um, so it's always been important for me to kind of do performance on the street, do performances in clubs, um, do cabaret, do drag, do, you know, do it in community centres, do it in schools, um, and the, the practice happens in all those spaces, you know, um, teaching in an art school, it, that, that performance is also happening there. Um, and the, <clears throat> so, yeah, but particularly, I mean, I'm so, so excited about turf projects because it, it's very unusual, I think, to have, you know, that footfall you know, um, you know, then I have to, I mean, there is a thing about people crossing the threshold, but I mean, that's why I was so obsessed with like just messing around with the window and being, um, but, but the proximity, I think, just to people who don't necessarily engage with crossing that cultural threshold and being visible within that. And um, I, in, in some ways, my one regret was not doing more because there were, there were, you know, they, Turf have a really good relationship with the um, shopping centre managers. Um, I mean, it's a shopping centre that's under threat. I mean, it's for years they've been threatening to knock it down and build um, a Westfield shopping centre. I think that's what they're meant to be building there at some point. Maybe it's happened already, I don't know. But, um, but there's a kind of openness. There was an opportunity. And I wish I'd done more, you know, in, in, in the shopping centre. But, yeah. Okay, great. Well, um, I think un unless there are any other raised hands, uh, we could probably wrap up for this wow. evening. Um, so, manager, does that sound good? To yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, I guess we could all, I mean, between probably Lily, Jessica and I, we could keep asking you questions all night, yeah. but um, it was just really terrific to get to hear so much about your work and your the process of making that work so thank you so much yeah thank you so much that was an incredible evening so um, i can try and do a quick um mass unmute so that we can give you a round of applause to make this seem a bit more um in, in person <laughs> hopefully that works thank you. thank you thank you very much thanks everyone thank you